John Wellwood was born in 1649. He was the son of James Wellwood, a minister in Dumfrieshire, Scotland. The rewards for faithful ministers in those days was persecution. But John pursued his calling to study and preach wherever he could. The authorities sought to apprehend him but were not successful. And falling sick, he escaped them forever and passed away at the age of 30. This is a sermon by John Wellwood. The text that he has chosen is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18. And I'll begin at the 17th verse of 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4.17 For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? It is a great matter for a man to come to heaven, even for a man that is very serious and faithful. It is true, there are many that think to be saved, yea, I think there are few of you that do not think to come at heaven. But I fear that not the tenth, nay, not the twentieth man of you will come there. Nay, even the very profane and ungodly men will think to come to heaven. This, however strange, is evident to any person that will but observe the delusion of the sons of men. Speak to godless men or natural men who know nothing of heart work or experiences in religion. Ask them, if they think they are in favor with God or think to obtain heaven. Yea, they think that everyone will get there. I believe ye think that heaven will be, so to speak, a cage of unclean creatures. But I tell you, there is no such thing at all. Few folk will come there. Lord, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Who amongst us shall dwell with devouring fire, who amongst us shall dwell with everlasting burnings, and who will be able to stand before him in that day. Now we shall hint at some things in general and shall give you some reasons why the righteous are scarcely saved. First, because none are so righteous as to be without their own faults, their own sins and failings. None are so righteous but that they have their own strayings, David confesses this, I have gone astray like a lost sheep, seek thy servant. And secondly, because God is a very holy and spotless God, and therefore it is very much, so to speak, to live with him. Not that he is an unmerciful God, or any way cruel, but he is so holy. He is so holy a God in his nature and divine perfections, and these being compared the corruptions that remain in the holiest of men and the spotless holiness of God and that infinite indignation that he hath against sin, I say, comparing these together, it is no wonder that the holiest of men find a difficulty in coming to heaven. David speaks of broken bones and of roaring all day long, but leaving the doctrinal part, we shall add some few uses. Use number one. Is it so that the righteous are scarcely saved? Then I think we may conclude that there will be few saved in this generation when the Lord comes to count and reckon with it. For if ye consider the revolutions of these times, we think it more than probable, considering too how long God hath spared us that there are sad days coming upon these lands, when God will judge and bring wrath and anger upon them. It will then be hard for the most godly and serious who have kept clean garments to be saved in that day. Indeed, 
Abraham, Lot, Jacob, Caleb, and Joshua escaped when the Lord had poured out His wrath on the generations wherein they lived. But indeed, they were a strange sort of persons. Then consider, if it has been so in the green tree, what will be done in the dry? If the Lord hath chastened His own people, if He has so sharply smitten them that their blood hath been shed and their heads have been set up in view of the world, if they have met with troubles and tossings, then what shall become of an ungodly party? What will come on malignants and prelates? What will come on our church and state folk? What will come on our magistrates and clergy and upon the ungodly people of the land? Think ye that if the Lord hath dealt so sharply with his own house and people that he will pass them by? Nay, I will tell you that the Lord hath a sword prepared for our king our counselors, courtiers, and nobles, for declaration takers, for prelates, curates, and lukewarm gentlemen. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. I am sure it will be a hard matter to escape at that day. There are many folk who think that they will bend down and let the blast go over them. Many think that they will live at ease in Zion, and others think they will be wise and keep a whole skin and keep their estates, lands, trades, and will not appear for God when He calls them to witness for Him. Well then, the Lord will send some strokes that will not only come on the folk that are not for God, but it will come upon all sorts of people. Truly, we think it is terrible to think of that day of the Lord that is a coming. As for our rulers, they have acted strongly and mightily against the Lord. And they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Yea, but he hath not. And they say, The Lord will not require what they have done. But as the Lord lives and reigns, he will repay them to their faces, all of them together, even from the greatest unto the least of them, from the king to the lowest. Without omitting one of them, he will repay them severely for all the mischiefs they have done. What are they? As many kings and counselors as would lie betwixt us and the sun are no more but a pile of grass before God. They are as nothing and less than nothing. He will care no more to beat the abominable party that we call rulers down to the lowest hell than I would do to tread a worm under my feet. Yea, his own people who have many sad days and nights about their sins, who wash and do all to keep themselves from their sins, yet they have sore bones and enough to do with it. And do you think that such an abominable party that have affronted Jesus Christ to his face, yea, we may say of our rulers, that they have cast out a flag of defiance against God, and have defied him before sun, moon, and all the world. Do you think that such shall escape? No, but he will come out of in battle array against them, and as he lives, he will lay them in the dust before it's long. Will you believe, sirs, that our great folk, our abominable declaration takers, do you believe that hellish prelates, abominable curates, and selfish, wicked noblemen Do you think that these gentlemen will escape the hand of God? I say they shall not at all. As he lives, he will thresh them down and their houses and make their posterity beggars. He will bring his indignation over them so that the generation to come will hiss at them. I profess this, that any person that considers matters at this day will see this generation gone perfectly out of their right wits. I confess it is a hard matter for a man to be saved, even when he is most circumspect and watchful. But, oh, to think what will come upon this generation. I will tell you that not only the wicked, persecuting party and the complying party will be overthrown, but even his own people shall not escape. We verily believe this, and he who believes shall see it. 
even his own people, even those who have the root of the matter in them, God will overthrow. He will send them in his anger through death. And he will spare few ministers, few nonconformist ministers. He will have them die in the wilderness. So there shall be but a few that shall come through and see the glory of the Lord. I fear there are but few that will be found for God. I will tell you, I think there are but few ministers that will be found what they ought to have been, and few people what they should have been as to the keeping their their garments clean. This hath been a blackening time, a tempting time. At first it sullied all sorts of folk. Alas, people were all defiled in the beginning with hearing the curates, complying with prelacy, and many folk grew secure, wary, crafty. All have bent their tongues to lies, but none have been valiant for the truth up and down Scotland. Few have been free for God, but a deep sort of compliance prevails amongst all sorts of folk. I will tell you truly what I think is the Lord's mind. It is this. I think the Lord will rid himself of this generation. I think that he hath sworn in his anger that until he have their heads underground, he will never do good for Scotland. He hath sworn that until he have this generation, ministers and professors in their winding sheets and the worms eating them up, he will stretch forth his hand against Scotland. <clears throat> they have been a party that have not acted for God. I do not deny but that a remnant shall be saved. But I think ye need not thatch houses with them that shall be saved. They will not be so many as folk think. I assure you that they will be odd sort of people whom God will save. They will be but a few ministers, professors, and Christians that he will spare. But he will have their carcasses dragged out of the way. I profess I think the land has gone quite wrong. As for our rulers, what are they but incarnate devils? And as for our nobles, we can hear tell of none of them for God. Indeed, we deny not, but there are some of them better than others are. Some have some sort of religion at heart, but dare not avow it. As for all our gentlemen that we can get in Scotland, we may write them in three inches of paper. And as for ministers, they are few. Of Christians, there are some more, but not many. And I will assure you, spare whom the Lord will. He will not spare professors. I think if he spare any, it will be the ignorant people in the north who have not known his name. But as for them that have known him and his mighty works, he will have them dragged out of the way. I think he may spare the young people that are rising, the young ones that know nothing. But as for the old Christians that have not been for God, he will have them taken out of the way. He will not let them live at all that have so exceedingly corrupted themselves. It would not have been thought that Scotland would have become so naughty. I think professors in Scotland will turn incarnate devils, and all of all the noblemen and gentlemen in Scotland, there shall not be twenty that will appear before God. I think I have doubled them. Who would have believed that Scotland would have been so naughty? Scotland hath been a nation full of hypocrisy, nothing but a whited wall. But stay until the play be ended and God will make a clean hand. He will not come up with a rake, so to speak, but with a besom that shall sweep malignants, prelates, noblemen, gentlemen. It will sweep them and their posterity away. It will sweep professors away also. I assure you as to the very godly that have been most free for God in their personal and particular walk, it shall be much for them to win through. It shall be much for them not to be overthrown in the deluge of wrath that is coming. I warrant there be many saying that they shall never be moved. Many say in their hearts with wicked men, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. But stay till God arise and plead, and he shall bring adversity on those that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountains of Samaria. 
and can carry handsomely in troubles, these shall go into captivity with the first that go into captivity. For I think that many in this land do not believe that there is a God or that he will do either good or evil. I see that this is so settled in the imagination of all ranks of people in Scotland that I I profess if the Lord stay many years awake, Scotland will become a company of devils and desperate atheists. And they will call the proud happy and say, it is vain to serve the Lord and shall think that those, the finest folks that can comply most and follow the course of the present times. I will tell you, I think many folk have been dreaming of deliverances, both ministers and professors. But if ye dream aright, ye will dream that God will come, send wrath and indignation, make Scotland tremble and overwhelm it as by the flood of Egypt. I'll tell you, if Scotland had deliverance, it were not telling them. Professors in Scotland would run mad. They would, they are fitter for the grave. God must rid himself of this generation, and that is a great part of its delivery. These things are but dreams with many who fancy the Lord hath no such thoughts. I assure you, they shall be odd folk that shall stand when he appears. They shall be folk that have neither touched, tasted, nor handled the corruptions of these times. If ye will take the deliverance right, take this of it. When the Lord shall deliver Scotland, there shall be glorious days in it, but it shall be a costly deliverance, and he will have the most of all sorts, especially ministers, swept away ere the deliverance come. And he will have folk that will not seek their own things, but his things. For if he cannot get a church to his mind, he cares not for it. He cares not to cast it into the depths of the seas. What cares he for the laws of men, or for kings, or councils? They are before him but as the dirt of the streets. He will have a church fitted for glorifying him, or else none at all. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Assyrians from Kerr. What am I concerned with you? What art thou, Scotland, unto me, more than the Turks or Americans? What cares he for ministers and professors? He can make us good out of the stones. He will have them out of the way. I will tell you that I think there are few downright for God in anything that I can take up. There are very few Caleb's and Joshua's It seems a very strange thing that many think God will take polluted, despised Scotland. Nay, he will have Scotland swept. He will have it turned upside down ere it be a platter for his service. There are many who think he will take Scotland and all the filthiness and sins that are in it. And why may he not make our rulers repent? And a number of such things. Indeed, he can make them repent. But truly, I tell you, He hath a mind to hurl them out of the way. Nay, he hath a mind to hurl the godly out of the way also. He will rid himself of the godly that have the root of the matter in them, and yet have not been even down for him. And do ye think that he will spare the malignant party? No, they shall not be spared. For if one part of hell be hotter than another, they shall have it. Use 2. Are the righteous scarcely saved? I would speak a word to them that are here. Whence is it that several of you have the confidence that ye shall be saved, since the righteous are scarcely saved? I think whoever is most godly will say that it is very much for him to get the hopes that he shall be saved. I remember saying of a godly man in error that when he was dying... For a long time, says he, I have gone, not gone through the length of the market cross without thoughts of God and Christ. Yet I am in doubt now about my salvation. What think ye of that, sirs? It is reported of one who lived many years a retired life, wholly taken up with the matters of his salvation, that after so long a time's retirement he was still in great vexation and perplexity about his soul's state. We speak not this to discourage you, as if the work of religion were a hard and intolerable work. 
But I will tell you the even down truth of the matter. The man that is saved goes through the severest trial, and it is well if he escapes with the life. It is a very great truth that the man who shall wrestle, weep, and cry, and shall lie out of his bed when others are in it, shall keep at a distance from sin and be humbled for it, shall have so much religion that all his neighbors wonder at it, when such a man hath been many days, nights, weeks, and years seriously taken up with the work of his salvation, minding nothing in comparison of it, daily mourning over sin, mortifying a body of sin and death, yet after all, it is much for that man who hath taken all this pains to attain unto the peace of God. I tell you, I think religion is another business than folk think it to be. I wish that many of those folk who have but a clipped religion that will not carry them to heaven knew the exercises of the truly godly. I think that is made out in this generation that many who in words have a form of godliness yet, indeed, deny the power thereof. I tell you, we have observed there would come out of a place three or four thousand, and amongst all those four thousand, in most places in Scotland, you shall not get me fifty, that in the judgment of charity are truly righteous. And again, take those fifty, and you shall think it much if there be forty that have the experience of heart work. You may possibly think this severe language. Yet we say, we have observed that there would come out of a place three or four thousand of whom there would not be fifty. That a judicious person in the judgment of charity could say upon examination, we're religious and Christian indeed. They have perhaps another walk than others, praying in their families and alone and have a good meaning. But heart religion is a strange thing. It is a serious business to take the kingdom of heaven by violence. It is a great matter for a man to get an eye to Christ, to get corruption mortified, and his heart set on things above. I remember what one says of people mistaking of grace. Grace is nothing but Christ conquering, triumphing, and fighting in the soul. Where grace is, there is much hammering between grace and corruption. I assure you, it is no small matter for a man to be redeemed from death from a devilish creature to become a heavenly creature, to have his life hid with Christ in God. Truly, religion is an uncouth business. I have heard of the seriousness of some folk. I have thought it strange that all their religion is to give the Lord a good evening and a good morning in prayer and a hearing of a sermon. Such never knew what it was to be pursuing after salvation to purpose never knew what it was to be concerned for their souls so as to forget all other things in comparison of this, never knew what it was to see the Lord Jesus and his sufficiency and a new way struck out to them that they knew not before. What it was to precede the morning with their cries. It is a very great truth that the most part of professors prove foolish virgins at the end of the day. I tell you, I am sure of it. If thou art a wise virgin, thou hast suspected thou wast a foolish virgin. And it hath been a great work unto thee to get it cleared that thou wast one of the wise virgins. Was it not unto thee to get that new name and white stone? But I profess I know not what you mean to do, and how you intend to be saved, and on what grounds ye have builded. For my part... When I have conferred with folk, I found few of them that could give me a reason of their hope. But they would senselessly say that they hoped to come to heaven and could say no more. But I would say that the righteous are scarcely saved. I know some serious persons that have been Christians fifty years that still have fears about their salvation. But I think there are several of you that have a little religion so little that a man would buy your religion over dear at one shilling, so to speak. Ye think, however, ye are going to heaven. Aye, but few come there. But I say, if ye knew the religion of those who are religious to purpose, it would astonish you and make you wonder. The daughters of Jerusalem said when the spouse was seeking her beloved, 
What is thy beloved more than another beloved? I assure you, it is another Christ, another salvation, another heaven, another glory they are aiming at than the most part of folk are seeking. If ye knew the religion of many, ye would stand astonished at it. Will ye but answer this question? Ye know that there is a heaven and there is a hell. In which of these two doth every one of you hope to land at the end of the day? Whether hope ye to be saved or damned, which of these two will ye land in, whether in salvation or damnation? All will have hope, but I will tell you that the devil and your own hearts have conspired to make you fools. I think some of you have hope, but you dare not say you are certain, or that you have sure grounds to build upon. But I beseech you, if you can hearken it to it, try whether your hope be right hope or not. There are some folk that build their hopes upon an unsure foundation, and their hopes are false. And what if your hopes be builded on such a foundation? The most part deal with a slip with slipping fingers in a matter of so great importance. Cast not away your souls, nor ruin them eternally. In the meantime, Ye know not, but ye shall have your lot eternally in devouring fire. For many are sleeping, and the devil is, as it were, drawing the very throat out of them. But says another, It may be that I am in Christ. But what if ye make pillows of that sort until the devil carry you away to hell? I tell you, you are an atheist that build upon such grounds. Maybe ye are in Christ. It may be that ye will go to heaven but it may be ye will be damned eternally. Nay, says another, it, it is more likely that I am in Christ than I am not. Now, how prove ye that it is more likely that you are in Christ? That is a strange business. It is an herb that grows not in every garden. Truly atheists think that it is likely they may go to heaven. Everybody hath a thought of going thither, but happy are they that have not their hopes built on such a foundation. The foolish virgins thought they would per- would certainly get to heaven. It is very difficult for a man to have the persuasion and experience of serious heart work. I have seen folk very serious, and yet it was to them a strange difficulty to be sure whether they would be saved. Whereas atheists who have nothing of religion hope to be saved, and yet sleep in a sound skin. I will tell you all is not gold that glitters. There are many religious curates in the land that will be not be such in, eter- in eternity. Everyone would think that such a man is religious, but his religion will not be current above. But I say unto you, man, if thou hast not tried it by the touchstone of Scripture and found thy religion to be good and current, I think thou art a perfect atheist. For the way that men can try whether gold be counterfeit is by the touchstone. Now the touchstone that folks should betake themselves to is the Scripture. Canst thou prove thy hope by the Scripture? The Spirit of God letting you see by that touchstone that you are religious? But I think, taken away many of us in the balance of the sanctuary, we will be found very light. I could wish that many of you were doubting of your clipped religion. It is the ruin of the most part of the world that they are like such as take money and look not whether it is good or bad, and so they are cheated. Many folk never question nor examine themselves about this, but remember that the righteous are scarcely saved. I can assure you it is much for one to attain unto salvation, even when he is wonderfully serious. I can assure you that many have watched day and night and have cried and repented and yet to this day are stark not. Many such religious men are in hell this day that had a greater religion than many of us have. I know a man that's still alive who is now a drunkard and a declaration taker that was once so serious that he hardly slept, being so taken up about his salvation and then lived godly, and yet is an atheist at this day I believe that many of you never had a perplexed day about your souls, and yet ye think you're religious. 
And if he had any convictions, they were bad, they were but cutted fingers that were soon healed again, like the scratch of a pin. If I had but one word to say, it would be this. Be sure that ye be in Christ, that the devil and your own deceitful hearts be not cheating you. I pray you take heed and have oil in your lamps, for there are many lukewarm people in this generation. Use number three. There is a third word of use. There are some truly godly, and ye have difficulty in attaining to the light of his countenance, to grace, to dominion over sin. Ye are often saying with the church, Is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow? But be content, for truth is, as Mr. Rutherford saith, we would have two summers in one year, heaven here and heaven hereafter. But it is very fair if we go to heaven, though it be in a bloody winding sheet. Asaph was soon puzzled in that case that he should be set in such an afflicted condition as he was. Verily, I have cleansed my hands in vain and washed my hands in innocency, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. And for mine own part, I know one that these seventeen years hath been in constant terror of soul, I think many here have never had so much all all their lifetime as this person had in one hour. So I say it is very well that you are saved and go not to hell eternally. It is very well, though a man be tossed in body and soul, if he get to heaven in the end. If he should lose health, means, wife and children, and be troubled every day, and yet get to heaven at last, it is well. I confess there are many in this generation that would have all conveniences, but I think it very well when the Lord is plucking up what he hath planted and throwing down what he hath built if a man gets his soul for a prey. While it is so, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. If ye get to heaven... Though ye swim through a sea of troubles, it is very well. There are two things that every man should labor to be at till he be, in a, until he be a conqueror. First, he should labor to be above sin and that he be in, a, in hazard by it no more. And secondly, to be above every cloud of desertion and to sail fair before the wind. But when he has lived an age, he must be content to have clouds and to have a body of sin and death to wrestle with. He must fall and rise, ride the ford as he finds it, and take take it as he comes to it. So my friends, be content if ye get heaven and have any assurance of that. It may be, if the Lord will, he will hold up his own. But the truth is, ye will have a, a sea voyage before you step within the gates of heaven. Corruptions will follow you, and will not leave you till you be within the threshold thereof. Till then, Satan will in, will pursue you. But when you are there, all your enemies will take the retreat and shall never vex you any more. But resolve ye must to meet with trouble and perplexity and waves roaring. But here is comfort. You shall not be made shipwreck of. There shall come upon you mountains of waves as if they would overwhelm you but they shall not prevail. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto you. Only I pray you take this note along with you, for I think many serious folk cannot get sin underfoot and cannot sensibly have God's countenance, yet ye must be content. Ye may say, if I could get the assurance of heaven, I would be better content. Nay, my friends, ye must be content to have darkness as well as assurance. You must be content with what you meet with, for unbelief and sin are the cause of it. Well, if folk get to heaven, it is very well, though your escape should be with your skin and your teeth. I warrant you, ye would be at ease. Our indulged folk must be at ease. And when the deceitful liberty was coming, all dreamed of ease and of sleeping in a sound skin. But hold your tongue, you shall be safe enough in heaven. But let us take God's way as long as we are here. It is a strange business. What would folk do with so much ease? 
If we were to live here eternally, folk might look for ease. But we will not be long here. Therefore, let us be faithful for God. Truly, I would never shed a tear, although God overthrow all these lands. The Lord has shaken a few out of their ease, and He is coming. It is then time for you to, it is, is it then time for you to sit at ease? Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? God cannot now get a house to set His gospel in, but ye must have your sealed houses. I should not care, though he should burn Edinburgh and Glasgow both. And all that will not act for God. Many thought it strange to see a stately piece of Glasgow burning, but I thought nothing of it. Why? Because they have burnt the covenants and destroyed the work of reformation. They have laid our pleasant things waste. And what though these cities should both be burned? A great business indeed. If God be honored, let none care whether or not people and houses should be cast into the bottom of the sea. It is a generation that hath blasphemous thoughts within them. They think, so to speak, that God was made for them, that Scotland was made that they might build houses in it and dwell in them. But the world was made to serve God, and if they will not use their power for Him, what need is there for many of them, be they kings? noblemen, or malignants. A great matter, though he should send them down to destruction. They are worth very little altogether. Folks' thoughts are clean wrong. But for a fourth word of use, are the righteous scarcely saved? Then I would say, truly, ye had need to be exact, watchful, and diligent. For I suppose ye are all wrong that are not at this work. God's anger is great against this generation. But ye will say, how shall we be watchful and diligent, as that we may be on good terms with God, and that he may have no controversies against us when he comes? Are ye thinking this? God is coming against Britain as he lives. In battle he shall come and drive down kings and nobles and prelates, and he will send forth hell and damnation amongst them. He will take vengeance on this land. Then whether or not ye are studying to walk uprightly? Now I will tell you that religion which would serve to carry a man through in Montrose's days and at Dunbar will not carry a man through in these times in Scotland's trial. I assure you he will be a strange man who will not be hit with a stroke when God comes in fury against these lands. I believe there are several that have not the least doubt but that they shall escape the wrath that is coming upon these lands. But many shall escape eternal wrath that shall not escape it. Therefore, ye have need to be exact in your walk. Ye have need to be on your watchtower. I profess that not only the foolish, but even the wise virgins will be found sleeping when God comes. I think there shall be few that shall not be made to tremble at his coming. Those that are most righteous will scarcely be saved. I confess that God will yet mow down the professors in Scotland, even as a man moweth down the grass. In the down, there will be few, but he will have somewhat against. Unto some he will say, Ye have heard the curates, and never mourn. Ye preached not at all hazards, and ye were not instant in season and out of season, but shifted and shunned hazards. To others, ye gave no faithful warning. And to others, ye did not redeem the time. Many sermons ye have heard, but little instruction ye have taken. And to others, he will have it to say, ye have made a confederacy with mine enemies. To gentlemen, he will have it to say, the things ye minded was only done. But I shall make soul, body, and all smart for these things. So I think there will be few, but he will have a sore and sad ditty against at that day. He will have uncouth things to say to folk, and he will find very few such as he would have them to be. Therefore I beseech you to be religious to purpose, for God is coming. Noah and Lot preached to the old world, but they were nothing the better. And this generation seemed to be persuaded that hell and damnation will be in the end, And yet they are hardened and given up 
unto the devil to be deluded. Truly I will tell you it is a well if there be one righteous in a parish. For my part I find few ministers or professors either, but what are quite wrong. As for people's public and private walk, there are few serious seekers of God so as to redeem the time when the days are evil. Oh, I will tell you where I think the life of religion lies. It is about the border, about Teviotdale, and about the Merns and Angus, and those professors that do not offer them help must be swept away. Those have got such a wrong cast that they cannot be serious. They cannot seek the Lord. There is such a spirit of stupidity amongst them. I pray you who are acquainted with this parish to tell them that God shall give to West Monkland such an awakening as shall make all their heads find the smart of it. They once had a minister who took much pains for their sakes. When he was not present with them, yet as to the generality of them, they have become inconstant like Reuben. If they get something for the back or the belly, they care none for care for none of these things. But I tell you, the wicked borderers up and down shall rise up and condemn this parish, even those borderers who have become zealous for the truth. If God plague not West Monkland, except there be serious repentance, I am far mistaken. They say they have got some dirt of the world, and they hug it, hug that in their arms, and they care for no other thing. But I could wish it were rather in the bottom of the sea. I wish it were quite away. But I will tell you this one thing. I am sure that for those men that prefer dung to Christ and duty, the Lord shall sweep both of them and it away. I am sure that there are many that will yet curse the day that ever they were laird or lord, that ever they had riches but they shall wish that they had gone begging from door to door. This is the thing. If I could word it, ordinary religion and diligence will not do the business, I assure you. You have need to get the thing very clear and to have your, your testificate lying beside you. Hast thou been dying daily? Hast thou been suffering daily? That is to say, hast thou been forecasting these things in thy mind? Hast thou been thinking, what shall I do if the papists should rise? and cut the throats of both great men and the mean men of this generation. Our king and council are all dreaming, and that is no strange matter, for readily great folk are still dreaming, but professors and even godly are dreaming too. There are few now awake, few upon their feet, and few upon their watchtower this day. In a word, all will have enough to do when the Lord shall come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Use number five. Are the righteous scarcely saved? Do not, I pray you, then misinterpret things when judgments come upon those lands. When it comes to that, say not that they had no religion in them. When God comes to punish Scotland, many a man that had his heart right with God will go to the grave that day. Mistake not his way when God smites some. Think not that ye are righteous and they wicked, and that ye that he hath burnt many folks' houses. Think it not strange. It is well if folk be not burnt themselves. It is a small matter they have met with in comparison of their sin. It is nothing at all. I wish you and all others to escape, though ye had twenty houses burnt down to the ground. I wish you may escape though the house be pulled down. For I assure you that many an honest man have been killed in his bed, his body being cast to the dogs, and his blood spilt upon the ground. This was the way he went to heaven. But this I would say unto you, do not mistake these things that the people of God meet with. We have heard of some godly folk that it would grieve one's heart and make one's hair stand upright to see or hear the afflictions they were in. So do not mis misinterpret that fire by thinking these were greater sinners than others or more guilty than yourselves. May these wicked bishops' houses escape and those churches that are polluted and that proves the contrary. But I will tell you what was the language of it. Not only to those who are under the present danger, 
but to the rest of the city and country adjacent who beheld it. And this was the language of the rod to the rulers, king, and council. Will ye not let out the prisoners? Yet it says God can let them out. Prove your damage. There is one whom they took before, and they have taken him unjustly again, and that contrary to their own laws. Therefore he must escape. I tell you there is a day coming when God shall consume Britain, and until that time his prisoners shall never altogether be freed. But then he will cause his desolating fire to loose them, and the wicked shall be enclosed in fire eternally. I remember the words of Jeremiah to Zedekiah when they were commanded to let the servants go free. Says Jeremiah, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine, and I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, the Lord shall proclaim liberty to those, and he will let the prisoners go free. And for that end, the sword must go up and down the city until the Lord proclaims a liberty to hell and destruction to receive them down, if they repent not. I could wish they would repent, but they are still running on in this evil way and hardening themselves, it seems, until the Lord make himself rid of them. It cries also, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Fear him that can burn houses. There is such a fear of councils, troopers, and soldiers, but the Lord can do that in a short time that they cannot do in a long time. I believe the Lord hath done more hurt to Glasgow by the fire, then the council and troopers have done all these years bygone. It is he that maketh the summer and winter, yet we show no due fear of him. But strong is the fear of men. These lands are soon frighted for any little thing whereby they may be exposed unto trouble. Ye fear not to break the laws of God, but ye fear to break the laws of men. What need we care so much for them? Let us rather fear him and serve him. This burning spoke this, Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that which endureth unto everlasting life. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Lay up your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. It had this cry also that men should not trust in uncertain riches, I warrant you, many a man took much pains to rear up these stones that the fire hath burnt down that forgot God in prayer. I warrant you, there were more pains taken in building up these stones than were taken by many about their salvation. It cries, ye have, treasure, have ye treasure in heaven? Are ye making sure of something that shall not, nay, cannot be taken away from you? Mary, <clears throat> Mary hath chosen that good part that shall not be taken away from her. So set not your affections upon the things of this world. Ye see lairdships and lordships sold and turned over from hand to hand, and yet some men will not stand to sell their souls for a bit of ground to their posterity. And it may be that, and maybe he that comes after them will squander away all. It says, Seek a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and a habitation that cannot be dissolved. It cries this, is it a time to plaster your houses while God's people are reducing, reduced to wandering and hardships? It is observable that it is the best piece of Glasgow that is burnt. And I think both Glasgow and Edinburgh shall be in the hollow ere all be done. Many gentlemen's and noblemen's houses shall go all to desolation ere it be all over. And it has another cry. It says that much sin was committed in these houses. And be what houses they will, sin might have been the cause of the wall being smitten again. It cries, If ye repent not, ye shall all likewise perish. It says unto thee, O Glasgow, if ye fear not and seek not God, he will send some sad thing against you. For when he sends his judgments, they have a loud call to others to take heed 
Therefore I beseech you to take heed. These people that had their houses burnt dreamed little, as little of such a judgment the night before as you do now. Prelates and malignants are dreaming little of judgments. And the devil thinks long, so to speak, to have them and perhaps he will get them time enough. Many of you think there are no judgments coming. But what ground can you have for that? Why? You are so secure. They are indeed happy that are secure upon good grounds. Therefore I beseech you by the mercies of God as you love the welfare of your own immortal souls, search your own souls, try your ways, and turn unto the Lord. Few spend time in prayer as they ought. Now, shall we say no more but this? Search out the evil of your ways and pray for enlightening grace. The Lord make you con- consider these things and to his name be everlasting praise. Amen. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.